opportunity to talk to you all about um, a journey to creativity. And um, we have 10 design principles that really inform our process, and one of those is challenge convention, which really is about this kind of journey um, from my standpoint in terms of what we're doing. So, a show of hands, who thinks that where we learn matters? Okay, love this. I'm totally preaching to the choir here. This is going to be so easy. So you all know that 25% of the population spends their day in the school, whether they're a student or a teacher working in the school. We have over 133,000 existing schools that need to have attention, and over 4,300 <coughs> colleges and universities as well. Um, so it puts in a little context. It's so important because students and faculty work in these buildings, and in terms of having this approach, it's about that fiduciary responsibility that we're demonstrating to the people who are assisting in paying for those buildings too. So um, at, uh, during the day, I um, am a design principal at LPA, but I also volunteer and share our US Green Building Council um, Green School Committee in Orange County. And so it's been a great opportunity to kind of marry all these wonderful aspects of my job together. But it's so important, this, de this definition about having a healthy environment that's conducive to learning. And kind of weaving through the story in terms of personalizing it a little bit, I think it's important because my sister, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, I really kind of come from a family of educators. And so I'm routinely telling them, I'm doing all this great green school stuff. And they're always looking at me like, Wendy, I, I have 38 plus kids in my class. I, I'm on the no child left behind list. I have parents who aren't engaged. No one comes to my open house. Like, what are green schools? Like, stop it. I need to have them learn how to read, right? Really kind of um, sad. And so I kind of really spent a, bar, a, a good part of this time um, figuring out what I can do personally to be able to change that. And, um, and as a part of the USGBC, they've given us this crazy challenge to create you know, green schools for everyone within this generation. They just went straight to the top. We're not gonna go for some, we're going for everyone, right? So it's a great mission to be able to take that story out. So a little bit about me. 10 years ago, or pardon me, 10 years into my career, I had the opportunity to um, work in my first school. And since that time, I've, had, I've been so fortunate to be able to work in just about every region of California bringing great educational facilities um, to districts and work in very different collaborative ways to address really different kind of program um, um, challenges. And, you know, I think we look back to the kinds of things that inspired us. And I was one of those crazy people who, like at age five, was telling people I was going to be an architect. And I always point to these, like, Richard Scarry books, which I just adored as a kid, right? Because they kind of, you could figure out the problem and get into a lot of what those kind of images were in terms of being something that inspired me. And I love the connection that something that may be in a student's school, a piece of signage, some way of conveying an idea, might make them lifelong learners in a way just from a simple kind of message that's integrated into where it is that they learn. We don't know how much impact this could actually um, have in terms of what they ultimately decide to do. So in marrying all of these things together, and I would say that I think I was struck the most by the fact that my sister really didn't believe that she could make a difference. She actually had the opportunity a couple of years ago to design a new school as her old school uh, was actually being taken down. No one ever asked her anything. It wasn't a real collaborative process. She didn't have a voice. And I want to make sure that that doesn't happen, that people are equipped with the information and the research that they need so they can be empowered to really make a difference and really have a voice that where we learn matters. And so I think that's really the opportunity that all of you have. As you leave this conference, You know, how can you make a difference in the environments where you are? <coughs> so kind of some um, experiences that I've had along this um, journey. About five years ago, we were given the opportunity to do an academic classroom addition to an existing campus in Southern San Diego. Um, we uh, were gifted with the fact that our clients again, we really like this to be a legal project. So we started right out of the gate in terms of what needed, we needed to be able to do to meet that challenge. Um, had great meetings, got all the way up through schematic design, had a, a wonderful approach to what the building was going to be, when all of a sudden one day, m and came in the meeting and said, you know, we've really given this thought and we don't want to go with that mechanical system, we want to go with conventional package units, you know, on the roof, and so we're just going to have to rethink this whole thing. A little frustrating, right, I and mean, we kind of made it all through this amount of work, 20% of the project is theoretically done, I don't know that that's very um, showing much fiduciary responsibility of kind of everyone's time and effort and those kinds of things. Had to go back and um, kind of rethink that. All the PV that we had on the roof disappeared um, from that standpoint because we needed it all for the mechanical equipment that had to sit up there. Um, fortunately, about a year later, they came back to us with another school in the district and they said, this time we want it to be Lee Platinum. 
I said, that's amazing. I don't know that there is a publicly planned school in California yet. We'd love to be the first public school to be able to achieve that. But first, we want to be able to meet with your maintenance department and let's talk about the mechanical approach that we're going to come up with. So kind of out of the hands of defeat, we were able to kind of come up with a very different kind of innovative approach um, from that standpoint. And we really looked at taking just conventional package units, putting them in the hub in the middle of the building, stacking them on the first and second floor so they could easily feed into that floor. And what that gave us back was the gift of a huge roof plane to be able to collect all of the um, gifts of the sun on the overall site. So we actually used our biggest constraint to become the gift of the entire project design solution from that standpoint. And um, in the process of that, we had the opportunity to look at actually displacement ventilation as a part of how the air was being delivered. So we have the ability to make sure that we have healthier kids um, going to school here and that really informed the overall design solution so on the top half you can see that we have the opportunity to collect the power of the sun it's all oriented in terms of how the um, roof is actually tilted you can see the displacement ventilation in terms of what's happening from that standpoint and then from a water standpoint that angle of the roof is actually allowing us to collect all the water and bring it where it's infiltrated on the south side back into the earth so it allowed us to really create that strong vision and partnership with the school district with all of their requirements in place as well. And about two weeks ago, middle school students started here. And it's just a really um, kind of lovely way that over that period of time, we were able to achieve such success on um, such a great project. Um, another great kind of story in terms of how we integrated that was at another middle school project where we were coming in to do a series of basically elective spaces on a middle school campus. So um, rather than showing up to our first meeting where we just have the art teacher telling us, you know, how many linear feet of paintbrush storage they needed, et cetera, to, you know, science, these kinds of requirements, we turned everything upside down and said that we we're going to be talking about learning studios that day to kind of just change their whole frame of reference about what it is they were doing. The school district had some fantastic goals about what they wanted to be doing to better prepare their middle students to go into the academies that were available for them at the high school. And so we took these really kind of siloed ideas of what these educational programs were and put them into an exercise where they had to describe the characteristics of those space. And so we talked about the different kinds of activities that were going to need to happen in the corner and created a series of different kinds of studios that would be a part of that kind of engagement with them. And at the end of it, had them kind of work in terms of coloring what kinds of spaces that they need. And what was really amazing when we looked at labeling these different kinds of studios that all of the teachers wanted to be in this creative studio. The science teacher, you know, the woodshop teacher, the art teacher. It was a really great way to kind of get them out of their day-to-day um, -day part of what it was in terms of their existing school environment and get them into a frame of mind about what was possible. And the result, when we look at this, it's currently under construction, is the fact that we were able to unify what was formerly, um, you know, very uh, discrete kinds of spaces into technology and hands-on um, environments with areas for small, medium, and large size groups to be able to work, flexible kind of program programming elements so something could be a TV studio, they could go outside and work on what they were doing, go next door and actually build it. We've been doing training with the teachers so that they can kind of get to a different level of collaboration in terms of what it's gonna take from a professional development standpoint to actually be able to use these kinds of spaces. But once again, kind of doing a paradigm shift in terms of what it was we needed to do to be able to have success um, with those teachers. <clears throat> with school starting, I think it's always a great time this time of year, um, you know, as students start school, you can see a lot of press coverage. And with the new Common Core in our local paper, there have been some huge stories about what the impact of that is going to be. And in reading some of those and preparing for this, I was um, really excited to read how excited the teachers are. I mean, we have this kind of quote about um, how they're looking forward to opportunities where they can take students out into the environment and be able to use that for their math and science um, classes. And that another person who's the director of curriculum instruction is kind of really talking about how exciting this is going to be in terms of real world applications, right? So there's a part of me that's thinking, wow, like leadership's really getting something and it's showing up in these stories. And Common Core is like this big kind of momentum change that's really going to make sense of what we all are talking about all the time in terms of 21st century learning. And I know that's going to marry well with everything that we're talking about in terms of green schools. But I still have this kind of nagging moment about, well, how are we going to make sure that people have that information? I still believe that we are, um, to be successful, we need a greater amount of evidence and research 
to continue to be able to prove to those people making pretty big fiduciary decisions that this is the right kind of thing to invest in. And so with that, in two years ago, with my USGBC committee hat on, our committee set out to actually create um, uh, an experimental project. And so we took two existing classrooms in an existing elementary school and um, had the ability to, about in December of 2011, install through a donation uh, monitoring control devices in both of these two classrooms. So every 15 minutes, they're measuring each one of these components. Um, HVAC energy, lighting energy, plug load, relative humidity, CO2, etc., to establish a baseline of what these two green school classrooms were going to be. We went through and did the design. Once again, kind of all volunteer. We worked with a lot of great vendors. We brought displacement ventilation into the space. We upgraded the lighting, brought in more integrated technology, tubular daylighting devices inside of the class. Really looked at what all the material is going to be in terms of um, a really healthy approach. So we took this existing classroom. And you can see in the upper image had the idea of the displacement ventilation again, and in the lower image that of daylighting. Eric will get into it in a little bit more detail. But in July 4th, Independence Day last year, it was like, oh my gosh, we really have enough funding. We're going to demo this classroom. I think that we have the ability to actually rebuild it because you know it was all donated in terms of what we were doing. So we took it down to studs, and um, on Labor Day, two months later. We had all the students in a completely renovated, what we called our kind of renovation classroom. And so what's great is that now today we have those same controls in place monitoring what's happening in that untouched classroom versus what's happening as a result of all of these improvements in the renovated classroom and are in the middle of collecting and doing a lot of research. We have a technical report being done right now. We are in the middle of um, doing some behavioral research because one of the first things that happened in January is the principal came in um, to a large meeting that we had and said, I haven't had any multiple day absences in this classroom yet. And everyone else in all the other classrooms has had significant issues of flu. Is that because of your mechanical system? <laughs> Holy cow, we'll figure out, like, is there, are you lucky or is this really something that's making sense? So we thought this was going to be something that was largely about energy and are thrilled to find out that it may in fact be something that's about health in all of those um, and all of what that means. So we've been doing uh, monthly reports in terms of our trends and observations, and the intent of this is to provide the kind of evidence that allow all of us collectively to be able to go and share this information with leaders to really make a difference um, from that standpoint in terms of um, our learning environments, because we know that where we learn matters. And um, we had, um, when the classroom opened, we actually had all the students go ahead and thank all of our donors in terms of you know what they um, had got out of the whole event. So I just you know love the solar tubes, love the cork boards. You know they are aware of it more than anything. But one of the most interesting things that came out of this is that the classroom next door now at the end of the year, um, they actually from a lighting level load in terms of looking at this used actually almost less lighting than the new classroom. And so we asked the teacher, so were you working really hard with your students to save energy because you're next door and all this stuff? She said, absolutely not. But we know there's kind of some behavioral ideas that, in fact, they probably were like, we are going to show that classroom. We are the most energy conscious students that ever were, right? And so what a wonderful outcome, too, that it doesn't take all the bells and whistles, that ultimately this is about understanding behavior and what we're going to do from that standpoint. So it's been a really exciting project to be a part of and really, um, bringing home how important everything is. So on Green Apple Day of Service last year, which was the first one, we had the opportunity to have an open house. So not only is it important because my daughter was there and kind of seeing what I'm doing, but my sister there on the left was like, is this what you've been talking about, really? I mean, what an amazing thing. And so she finally made the connection for the first time that there are simple things, but that hopefully it allows her in the future and with all of her colleagues and all of you and all the people that you work with to really know that you can make a difference and that there are people like us all trying to provide the evidence and the research that's necessary to kind of carry our good work forward. And so with that.